Um, thank you all so much for coming out here. I absolutely did not expect this big of a turnout. Um, I know many of you, but there's, there's also many of you I don't know. Um, just a little bit about myself. My name is Ethan Linehan, and I am a senior. I'm studying philosophy and history here. Um, now you might want to know, how the, hey, welcome, welcome. You guys, you might want to pull a chair in. All right. Or if you like the floor, that's open to you. I'll just hang out here. Cool. Um, yeah, so many of you might be wondering, how the hell did I get into Marxism? Um, and the story starts back in 2012, when I campaigned for Ron Paul. Um, <laughs> I, uh, back then, I considered myself fiscally conservative, socially liberal. I thought that was the best of both worlds. And I thought that that was the best chance I had at living a free life. Um, then after he didn't win, I became very disenchanted with politics. I thought, wow, the government's so fucked up. It's above my head. There's nothing I can do to change it. Everything's going to be this way forever. Why bother? But then I slowly started to creep up to last year's election, and I realized that um, politics still goes on whether I'm interested in it or not. Hey, what's up, y'all? Um, I was just recounting how I was a libertarian back in 2012, and then <laughs> this is my journey of uh, finding Marxism. Um, I realized politics, even though I wasn't interested in it, it still goes on. Decisions are made above my head that affect me, even if I don't know about them. Um, and I realized I didn't know a whole lot about them. So I started to um, get into politics, even though I was so frustrated with the whole thing. I thought anarchism was a very attractive label. Um, you know, minimal to no government at all. Then one day on Wikipedia, I stumbled upon an article called Anarcho-Communism. That certainly sounded like a contradiction to me. That was like an oxymoron. How the hell does those two things go together? Um, I started to do more research on the anarchist side, more research on the communist side, and I'm like, wow, maybe the old ways I treated freedom aren't necessarily the best ways of thinking about freedom. Um, it's still an absolutely worthy goal, but there might be different ways to realize it than the libertarian ticket was telling me. Um, it, it also helped that a lot of libertarians were found guilty of pedophilia and... <laughs> and, um, and so some, some friend of mine shared with me a Marxist uh, economist talking about some very interesting things, and although I disagreed with him wholeheartedly, I thought it was compelling enough to listen to. Um, and then one day I checked my email and I found a message from the organization here on campus called Platypus, and that's an eye-catching name right there. I don't know what the hell a platypus uh, has anything to do with politics, so I went to a reading group uh, about a year ago, and I've been hooked ever since. The talk you are here to listen to today is called Does Marxism Even Matter? Subtitled Freedom History. Um, now, I'm going to speak off script every now and then, but I think I can get you out of here in 45 minutes if I stick to the script, so allow me to do that most of the time. Let me tell you a little bit more about Platypus real quick. They started back in 2006 as a reading group between some uh, professors and students at the University of Chicago. Some of their students went to the professor and they're like, hey, there's some stuff going on about this anti-war protest for Iraq, and there's all these other things. Let's learn more about them. Uh, they started asking questions about why has the left become such a weak force in politics, but yet those ideas still appeal to a lot of people. Um, and then they, they wanted to critique and educate towards a goal, the reconstitution of an emancipatory left. Um, how do they do this? Well, we organize reading groups like the one we have here on campus, the one that I found. Um, we have public fora with different speakers on panels. We've had all kinds of people, Noam Chomsky, Slavoj Zizek. Um, we've had other people that aren't even on the left. We've had some of the people on the panels. We've had teach-ins like the one you're at today. Typically, we have journals called the Platypus Review, but the person who is here to help me distribute those, his transmission died, so he's not here with us today. Um, and we do it through research. And all of this amounts to hosting the conversation. Um, we invite people from various political backgrounds uh, to talk about both historical things and contemporary things. Um, and this is a mission statement for us, but I want to draw your attention to one thing real quick. Numerous failures. That stands out to so many people when they think about the left. Stalinism is the biggest one, I, I assume. And I want you to know right off the bat that we in Platypus critique those things as well. We aren't 
we aren't Stalinist apologies, apologetics. So, um, what we do is we ask the question: What has the left been? What can it yet become? If the left is to change the world, it must force first transform itself. Where are we now? We're in every continent except Antarctica, uh, most major <laughs> metropolitan <laughs> cities. Um, we, it has at least a reading group or an established member there. Just yesterday, we came out with our 100th issue of the Platypus Review. That's about 10 every year, if you can do that math. Um, we've held dozens of interviews with the famous people I mentioned. We've had nine international conferences and hundreds of conversations. Uh, this local chapter, um, like I mentioned, we have reading groups every Wednesday. Um, the reading group topic for this week actually has to do with some of the things I've been mentioning at the beginning of our uh, talk. So if you'd like to come and hear more about it or, or tell us everything that you disagree with, by all means, come by. <laughs> we have informal coffee breaks also where we talk about a lot of contemporary issues. Um, most of the coffee breaks last year had to do with the election. Um, just that come up in conversation a lot. We have lots of film screenings. We might even have more teach-ins. Those will be announced. Panel discussions, we're working on some. Um, and then the PR is usually available. I will get you some copies if you want those. All right, so a recent panel we had was Anarchism and Marxism, Radical Ideologies Today. That was back in 2014, very successful. It's actually how our chapter head found the organization. He went to that panel. And uh, one of our other members, Corey, he went there too. Um, then the next year we had a panel called Black Politics and State Violence. Um, Dr. Williams works here. Amelia Parker is actually running for one of the council positions in the city right now. Um, it was a very successful panel. And then just last April, we had our panel called Electoral Politics on the Left. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we have some panels coming up. We're working on these. They're not all locks. They're in the works. Um, you, can read those, you can read those titles right there. Um, if you're interested in getting involved, please let me know. Reach out to me. Um, these panels are a lot of fun to put together, and you can have a role in finding speakers for them and what have you. All right, who's ready to get started? Everybody? <laughs> All right. Raise your hands if you have ever watched a TV show called The Walking Dead. All right, keep them raised. If you have ever seen The Hand Handmaid's Tale, Battlestar Galactica, Black Mirror, The Man in the High Castle. All right, put your hands down. Now, put your hands back up if you have ever watched a movie called The Hunger Games. All right. 1984. V for Vendetta. I Am Legend. Idiocracy. Zombieland. The Matrix. Fahrenheit 451. A Clockwork Orange. Mad Max. Blade Runner. Blade Runner, excuse me. And Wally. <laughs> yes. All right, put your hands up. Now, if you looked around the room at all during this game we just played, you saw how many people had their hands up for these things. And everything I just mentioned has at least one thing in common. They're all dystopian. Now, what does dystopian mean? Well, popular culture is saturated with these dystopian visions of the end of times, zombie apocalypses, cannibalism, big brother watchman states, and otherwise unpleasant futures. And add to that what the media chooses to show you relating to environmental catastrophe and nuclear disaster, and you may never see a damn happy thing on TV. Um, now stop and ask yourself this. Why are dystopian visions for the future so prevalent while utopian visions are notably absent? When was the last time you saw a film or a show with a healthier, freer society that had worked out some of the problems from which we suffer today? What does it mean for our future as humans? We can neither imagine what it would mean to be greater than we are today, nor can we imagine how we might achieve such a utopian future. In this teaching, I'm going to help you uh, think about these questions. But I'm not here to say, you don't know any of this stuff, let me teach you. Not even close. I would rather build on what you already know, help fill in some of the gaps, and use this teaching to help make sense of those important issues. Uh, go on this ride with me today. <laughs> if we can learn where to go by learning where we have been, maybe, just maybe, we can apply lessons from history when discovering our task for the future. <laughs> Alright, here's a beautiful timeline. I love timelines in context. 
Um, you might be wondering what this question mark is for, let me tell you. <coughs> Just as all animals do, humans too have to work to stay alive. After all, we're not plants. Uh, what separates humans from animals is how we organize this life-sustaining work. Uh, as soon as our ancestors emerged from the animal kingdom, humans arranged themselves in close blood groups or kinships. Uh, these kinship groups organized the process of taking raw materials from nature and adding a new element to them, human labor. Human labor can take raw food and cook it, animal bones and carve it, iron and forge it, etc. That humans have the physical and mental power to substantially alter what we find in nature was obvious as early as 200,000 years ago. Add 30,000 years and humans are wearing clothing. Add another 100,000 years, and the first known cave paintings appear. Around 64,000 BCE, humans replaced the spear with the bow and arrows. Before 50,000 BCE, you had sewing needles and musical instruments. Around 8,000 years ago, you have ships that can travel through harsh oceans to fish in deep waters. Shortly after 30,000 BCE, ovens replaced mere fireplaces. Pottery and basket weaving allowed the carrying and storing of goods humans could make rope, and tools like harpoons and saws existed. Humans are inclined to make their lives easier. Why work hard when you can work smart? More free time is the default desire. With every new tool or technique, subsisting was easier. In the thousands of years of prehistory just covered, humans increased their creative capacities so much that authorities estimate the population of the Earth was around 5 million by 10,000 BC. With such productive capacities available, the relationships which people have with each other in order to fulfill their basic needs, those relationships were bound to change. Where formerly human kinship groups consisted of nomadic hunter-gatherer types, resources were usually so scarce that survival was a daily struggle. Whatever resources were secured were distributed to the entire kin group without any notions of ownership. All members of the kin demanded free access to nature, the main means of production. Any notions of leadership were also absent beyond the kin group elder or a strong hunter or gatherer that would decide questions about distribution. Imagine you're at Thanksgiving dinner and grandma cuts the turkey. Um, you just let her do it because she's good at it and she decides that everyone gets enough turkey to eat. But your aunt could just as easily do it, your dad could just as easily do it. You only pick her because she's got some experience doing it. You could easily remove your grandma from that role. Then, around the year 10,000 BCE, tremendous changes happened to human behavior. Humans passed through the agricultural revolution. Knowledge about crop and animal <coughs> domestication um, exploded. Large-scale agriculture was possible, and larger populations could be supported in world communities. Increases in productive capacity allowed humans to produce more than they needed. Uh, the best kinship groups could produce what is called a surplus. It's an extra, an extra of stuff that they needed to survive. Um, this surplus gave humans the freedom to progress beyond mere subsistence and focus on other things, which usually meant developing production even more so they could limit scarcity. Uh, humans, through their creative powers, ended their daily struggle for food and water. But how often has fixing one problem led to a new and different problem? Once human society could create a surplus, that surplus had to be managed somehow. The role of collecting and redistributing surpluses had to be filled if all the members of the community were able to meet their basic needs. You can imagine how over time the person or family in charge of the production and distribution of surplus, that could become a source of privilege. The person or family might skim some off the top at the expense of others just to make sure that he and his were taken care of. The emergence of control over the means of production by a section of society was a radical departure in human social arrangements. Labor was no longer controlled by society as a whole. Such societies ceased to be communities with a common interest and became divided. No longer did society work to meet the needs of everyone. One class in society owned the means of production while the other classes had to labor for that owning class. Each class looked out for their own interests. The communal way of life broke down once the mode of production changed. And you will see this pattern happen again as we go along. I love PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Some of the earliest class-based societies will be familiar to you, and they took the form of masters and slaves. Masters owned the means of production, and they bought or captured slaves to labor for them. Whatever slaves produced, the masters took and sold. The masters gave just enough back to the slaves to survive, but they pocketed the rest. Naturally, the class antagonisms between masters and slaves led to open conflict. It was at this point in human history that the state was invented. Armed bodies were needed to keep order. Laws and religions were needed to shape public ideology. The state did not always exist. And as you will find out, the state does not always have to exist. The state is merely an instrument for one class to dominate the other. Eventually, the mode of production developed again, and societal relations changed with it. In most of the world, slave societies were replaced by feudal societies. Under feudalism, the class who labors is not made of slaves, but peasants. Peasants are not the property of the feudal lord, they own themselves. The feudal lord still owns the lands and the tools, though. The lord allows the peasant and his family to live on the lands. The peasant works Monday through Wednesday on his own land, taking on whatever he produces. But Thursday through Saturday, the peasant goes to the Lord's land and produces the surplus. When these days are done, the Lord takes whatever the peasant produces. And on Sunday, the peasant rests again to do it all the next week. Under both slavery and feudalism, the owner reaps some of the fruits of someone else's labor. And from 10,000 BCE to about 1500 BCE, or no, 1500 CE, Traditional societies took some form resembling either slavery or feudalism. With these class-based societies, every, every member knew his or her role. And if you're familiar with the caste system in India, you probably know what I mean. Um, your role in life was predetermined. Uh, you would grow up to be a carpenter because your dad was a carpenter, because your granddad was a carpenter, and so on. <laughs> um, and even the nobility knew their place in society, too. If a prince squandered his wealth and fell off the wagon and became destitute, he was still noble by birth. Uh, traditional societies had what we call the great chain of being. The same way of living was reproduced generation after generation after generation. You always had a role to participate in some meaningful way to contribute to the progress of society. Now we moderns might frown on these societies because the great chain of being it has little upward mobility. but you might be able to sympathize with the ancients. This way of life certainly seemed attractive. And the ide ideologies of this time reflected and reinforced this stratification, most notably in the form of religion. Ancient mythologies of the Greeks and Romans explicitly stated the rank order of humans. If anybody's read Plato's Republic, that's a secular expression of this, where he ranked people by gold, silver, bronze, what have you. Um, the Egyptian religion existed more or less to justify the rules of the pharaoh. Other pagan religions perform the same role, and I might step on some toes, but as a former Catholic, I might say that even Catholicism exists to justify some sort of stratification in the physical and spiritual realms. All values and truths come from God, who then crowns the Pope as leader of all believers. And you have a hierarchy of cardinals, bishops, and priests who enforce that faith among the lay people, who must prostrate themselves in the face of the divine. But all things change, and in this teaching, traditional society must be burst asunder. Beginning around the 16th century, human development entered into what historians call bourgeois society. In Europe, the Renaissance led to an explosion of culture and the, develop the development of human creativity. Scientists largely rejected the dogmatism and mystical worldview of the Catholic Church in favor of empirical knowledge and a scientific understanding of the world. The Catholic Church suffered through the Great Schism from which the Protestant faith formed. Uh, many Catholics consider the Protestantism as the first heresy that was not put down. <laughs> in Protestantism, the way of finding values and truth is not to defer to some higher authority like the Pope. Rather, the Protestant way is the priesthood of all believers. Everyone can consult the Holy Scripture in their own vernacular language rather than in Old Latin. Everyone can consult their own conscience to decide for themselves what to believe. Uh, they perform the sacraments for themselves in a way, like inner confession rather than going to a priest. And that self-legislation, strangely, leads to atheism. 
Protestantism undermines itself with the demotion of divinity and the elevation of humanity. By placing humans as the ultimate arbiter of truth and value, God thereby becomes superfluous. This obviously does not mean that everyone for the last 300 years was an atheist, but it does mean that society is not centered on any particular religion anymore. Theology was not the only domain to radically change in bourgeois society. Uh, bourgeois society is called the Epic of Lights because that clearly contrasts with the Dark Ages that came before it. The Enlightenment dominated the minds of thinkers for generations. In the cafes and salons of Europe, reason became the byword for justifying everything. Immanuel Kant, in his famous pamphlet, What is the Enlightenment?, unofficially made the motto of the era of sapere aude, which means dare to know. And philosophers did not stay up in their ivory towers or in their new science labs. The top names of the day came to influence politics in ways never before seen. Systems of authority were only legitimate insofar as they were rational, if they could advance the ideals of liberty, fraternity, and equality. And names very dear to American hearts, like John Locke, Thomas Paine, Adam Smith, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, they all came of age and into the spotlight during the Enlightenment. Gone was the public toleration for authoritarian governments and absolutist monarchies. Here were the new modern ideals of democratic republics founded on classical liberal social contracts and natural human rights. Nowhere was this more clear than in the two most important revolutions of this time, the American and the French revolutions. The old divine right of kings was replaced by the consent of the government. Uh, the new modern values of the Enlightenment did not slip past philosophers. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, his big contribution to philosophy was the notion of perfectibility, that the possibilities for being human are multiple and endless. And Rousseau put unusual stress on history <laughs> he put unusual stress on history as the site where the true nature of humans is simultaneously realized and perverted, revealed and distorted. A new way of thinking about the human condition had appeared. The society, rather than nature, is the source of freedom. As Rousseau taught us, man in part produces his own being. We do not act strictly according to a permanent nature or a fixed essence, but rather we produce our own nature. History is the record of this self-production. It is the creative activity of a historical being. Um, whoever dares to establish a people's institution must feel himself capable of changing human nature, of transforming each individual and I'll get down. He has to take from man his own powers and give him in exchange alien powers, which he cannot employ without the help of other men. Rousseau understood that the most radical possibilities of freedom take place in society, the sight of those new and alien powers. Rousseau described this as, quote, natural freedom sacrificed then for moral freedom, which was the freedom to act in unnatural ways. For Rousseau, such freedom was radically ambivalent. It could be good or it could be bad. But the problem that society found itself in could only be solved socially, not individually. For Rousseau, it was human nature to be free. Humans achieved a higher freedom in society than they can enjoy as animals with mere physical freedom in nature. Indeed, in nature, humans are not even that free, but rather slaves to their needs and their instincts. Only in society could freedom be achieved when humans free themselves from their natural animal condition. And the example that always pops into my mind is the fact that in the 21st century we eat marshmallows and Diet Coke. No animal in their right mind ever thought of this. That is not a need that they have in nature. We, once we came into society and we developed our productive capacities, we could then transform into the fact that some people can eat those things. But first, society had to be clear about its aims and practice as well as in theory. Rousseau was the first to articulate this new modern task of social freedom. How might we examine our actual theories and practices to find our self-imposed conditions of unfreedom? The philosopher Hegel later wrote that the principles of freedom dawned on the world in Rousseau. 
Hegel built upon Kant and Rousseau in his pursuit of the philosophy of history. And he wanted to account for changes in freedom. He wanted to ask his readers, what is rational in history? And he starts off by discussing every atrocity and major heartbreak that happened in history. And he asks, if history so far has been a slaughter bench, what was the ultimate goal for which these monstrous sacrifices were made? Well, Hegel says, history is the progress in the consciousness of freedom. The Orientals, and nowadays we don't use that term, but he used it in 1837. The Orientals knew that only one person is free. The Greeks and Romans knew that some are free. And while we moderns know that all humans are implicitly free as human. And Hegel says the final goal of the world is to be conscious of our freedom and to actualize that freedom, to bring it into existence. Now, just as we saw with slave systems and with feudalism, the level of ideas is very much informed by the level of material conditions. The bourgeois enlightenment in thought had its corresponding change in the economy. People were attracted to the destruction of traditional society because they were witnessing the destruction of all fixed, one-sided ways of living. The separation of society into strict, strict castes, that was abolished. Without the great chain of being, people felt like they truly could relate to each other. For the vast majority of common people, for those who were ignorant of divinity and without noble titles, who for most of history were peasants living through subsistence agriculture, who were a mute background against the pageantry of the ancient world, bourgeois society was truly revolutionary and free. Those who had no other property except for their labor were formerly nothing, but after the revolts of the common people throughout Europe, they were everything. Humans who could at least offer their own labor could become self-made. They would do so on the basis of their work, their activity in society, which would find purchase not in a strict hierarchy of traditional values, but rather through a free market of goods and ideas. People would be free to find their own values in society. And the highest values in modern society are not religion, they're not the honor of a warrior code, but it's rather material productivity and efficiency. Being a productive member of society is very valuable. In market society, the rational pursuit of one's own self-interest was understood to contribute to the betterment of society as a whole. This was because early forms of competition required one to improve their practices, their creative, uh, creative acts and ingenuity. Um, the whole enlightenment process of debating everything is a perfect example of that. In market society, you are neither a slave to a master, nor are you the serf to a lord. You are neither property, nor are you indentured. You are free to sign contracts with anyone offering them, and in return for a wage, you will labor productively. You are free to leave your farm and take work in the city. You are free to leave your boring country and find work in exotic places. When capitalism came onto the scene, it felt like a human could be free for the first time. Everyone was considered free to better themselves. Progress was understood to emerge out of this society, out of commerce and exchange. The members of a market consciously reflected on their own practices, actively guiding the direction of its own development. Every individual was contributing to a greater unfolding of freedom, of social progress, simply on the basis of their own self-interested wage labor. Now you might wonder, why did capitalism even develop during bourgeois society? Well, after all, capital had existed along with wage, labor, and contracts for, on a small scale for way before the bourgeois society. But they were not the dominant mode of production. As, we, as you remember, slavery, feudalism, some combination, that was the dominant mode of production. But as we saw in bourgeois society, feudal manners were broken up when the serfs demanded their freedom from working on the vast estates. Likewise, the authoritarian, top-down system of mercantilism, so popular during the colonial era, uh, it had so many tariffs and quotas, and it was shown to be wasteful and very stagnant in its growth. And it was replaced by the free market and all of its creative dynamism. Capitalism is one of the most dynamic processes in human history. And it had legal protection for its free trade. Now, I want you all to take note real quick 
that the free market actually required some state protection and intervention to allow its flourishing. For capitalism to become the dominant economic model, that required a specific set of conditions. And all of these conditions happened. The Industrial Revolution provided the physical infrastructure, allowing the circulation of goods on a large scale. Land could now be privately owned and traded rather than owned by a feudal state. Workers were now free to sell their labor power rather than work on a feudal estate. The bourgeoisie, which was the rising class of capitalist merchants, became the dominant members of the new liberal democracies of the age, thereby securing political influence and protection for the capitalist system that was so heralded. How are we doing on the battery? Good. Good. Okay, let's take a look under the hood. Let's discover in what ways the capitalism was radically different than what it replaced, in what ways it might be more of the same, and in what ways capitalism relates to the progressive unfolding of freedom in history. Uh, specifically, let's look at the nature of wage labor to see where the surplus value goes, like we did with the other systems. All right, I need a volunteer. Okay, you can stay in your seat for this. This is just a mental demonstration. Get it? Cool. Imagine, Kendrick, imagine you're a shoe factory worker in 19th century England. Um, slavery had actually been outlawed, so you, you definitely could be a worker. Um, <laughs> um, you show up at work, and you do the labor making shoes, and then you go home. Your boss then takes those shoes that you made, and he sells them on the market, and he makes a profit. Your boss then takes that profit and he divides it multiple ways. Uh, some of it's got to be reinvested into the shoe business. The lights have to stay on, more shoe materials have to be bought, taxes to the government got to be paid, all that. But your boss still has some left over after that. And he pays you a wage and maybe even some benefits because of all that productive labor you did. But he can't pay you all of his leftovers because how else would your boss get paid? He still has to pay himself. So he takes some of the money he made by selling the shoes that you made. Sometimes the cut that your boss takes is small, sometimes it's large, but your boss will always pay you less than the total he can sell the product of your labor for. But here's the strange part. Kendrick, you don't get a say in how big that cut is. Your boss is the boss, not you. The owner of the business makes the decisions that affect himself and you. And your bosses decide how much to pay you and how much to pay themselves. Your bosses decide maybe they need to lay off some workers and move overseas. Your bosses decide that they need to make poor quality products and mark up the prices. Your bosses decide maybe they need to make environmentally dangerous products because that's, that's better for business. Your bosses decide you should work more hours in the week and be extra productive. But you don't get much say in this. Most businesses, large or small, are run with this kind of model where a small group makes decisions for everyone else. The fruit of your labor is taken and managed independently of you. And if you took some shoes home from work, the boys in blue would show up at your house and take you to jail. Despite bourgeois society being the birth of democracy and politics, it still lacks de democracy in the workplace. You spend more than eight hours a day, five days a week at work. Most of your life is spent in this undemocratic atmosphere. You could quit and try for another job, but there's no feudal land to go back to. All the land and the resources that you depend on are privately owned. The only way you can provide food and shelter for yourself and your loved ones is by selling your labor power to the highest bidder and agreeing to whatever that contract says. Or you could try to steal. Maybe you can acquire enough capital to move out of the workforce and become an owner yourself. But math shows that that can't happen for everybody. There, all, there must always be more workers than owners if capitalism is to continue. The priority of the workers is to get a job whose wage is high and working hours are low. The priority of the owners is to make as much of a profit as possible because if they don't, the, other's owner, the other owners will. This profit margin is accomplished in many ways. The quality of the product could be reduced so it could be made cheaper. If you've heard of obsolescence, uh, planned obsolescence, then you know that the technology exists to make things like tires that never wear, 
light bulbs that never go out. Uh, tire owners and light bulb owners would never have any customers if they sold products that were perfect, so they have to intentionally break them. The profit margin could also be achieved by paying you less. If you can cut payments but still have you come back to work because you need that paycheck, then you make even more of a profit. The profit margin is also achieved by getting more production out of you. You can hire managers and to discipline the workers or to set strict guidelines to keep the workers active. Um, if you've ever watched, um, I don't know, old pirate movies, oftentimes pirates became pirates because they were tired of their captain beating the shit out of them. So they just killed their captain and took over the ship. <laughs> uh, that's not what I'm advocating, by the way. <laughs> Kendrick, I don't know if you have a job, but don't show up at work and kill your boss. Um, let's see. All right, so if the owner can get twice as many good tires or light bulbs by physically beating you or mentally beating you, then it's going to be done. The worker continues to labor for the capitalist long after the worker has produced enough value to keep himself alive. You make a number of shoes that will allow you to stay alive, but you make more shoes than that, way more shoes than that. Um, sometimes owners even threaten the workers with their job security. They'll point outside saying, look at all those unemployed people ready to take your job. The unemployed have plenty of skills to offer, but they're excluded because they cost too much. You can't hire them if you're not going to make a profit. In these ways, unemployment is not a temporary mistake that the market will eventually sort out. Rather, unemployment is actually advantageous to capitalists, and it must be preserved. Eventually, because the owners acquire profit and because technology is widely available and very productive, unemployment becomes a problem. It's cheaper to get a machine that can do the work of ten good men or women. So many dystopian movies and shows depict a future where robots have taken over, but automation is already a concern in our lifetime. How many news reports have you, shown, have you seen that put fast food workers um, out of a job because they were replaced by machines? Those fast food jobs don't exist anymore, but the people that used to work those jobs still exist, with all the same needs for money and resources that they used to have, but now they have no job. Automation is hitting countless industries in the 21st century. Here's the kicker. When your livelihood is tied to having a job and the jobs are quickly disappearing, then your livelihood is in danger. When the freedom of bourgeois society comes from being able to do wage labor, but there is not enough wage labor for every member of society, then the limitations of the society should be called into question. With the focus on ever increasing production for ever larger profits, capital does not serve the needs of the people. The people, in fact, serve the needs of capital. Um, let's see. The ancient conception, this is contracting, or contrasting these two ways of life. The ancient conception in which man always appears as the aim of production seems very much more exalted than the modern world, where production is the aim of man and wealth the aim of production. Uh, what is wealth if not the universality of needs? Um, what, if not the ab absolute elaboration of creative dispositions? Um, that's what wealth is. Um, bourgeois political economy is, is the epic of production. Um, it appears as the total alienation of man. Um, the ancient way of life actually appears to be superior to many um, because they, they used to seek for closed shape, form, and established limitation. The ancients provide a narrow satisfaction, whereas the modern world leaves us unsatisfied, or where it appears to be satisfied with itself as vulgar and mean. In traditional society, we were driven to work for our preservation and for the preservation of the status quo with little or no change. Under capitalism, however, we are driven to work for the preservation of capital, which requires constant change, constant development, but for none of the reasons that traditional society had, like God or the caste system. Now I should note, and this is very important, if you want to get a really good handle on what Marxists believe. This distinction between those who own the means of production and those who labor with them, those who employ and those that are employed, is not somehow inherently evil. 
It's a very rational process by which all members of society pursue their own self-interests, and that's all we can ask of humans. But the point is merely that society is divided into these two opposed classes whose interests conflict with each other. Slave societies had the master and the slave. Feudalism had the lord and the serf. Capitalism has the owner and the worker. Just because capitalism developed as an improvement upon older models does not mean that capitalism itself could not or should not be overcome. Capitalism is not the end of history. Now, each and every one of you came to this talk today because you take the question of freedom very seriously. Now let's look at some ways where we might become even freer than we are today. No. Not yet. Okay. It is my contention, and Platypus' contention, that Karl Marx is someone you can consult when looking for ways to become freer than we are today. Marx, he lived from 1818 to 1883, and he spent his life doing odd jobs just to make enough money so he could have more time to go to the library. He got kicked out of the Library of London on a nightly basis, because then he'd go to the pub and get shit faced. <laughs> <laughs> uh, contrary to popular opinion, Marxism is more a theory of capitalism than anything else. Marxism relates to communism only insofar as it shows the achievements and limitations of capitalism and proposes communism as a way to advance that progression of freedom in human society that we keep talking about. If you read Marx's works, then you will know that he had thoroughly read the political economists of his day, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, etc. In many works, he spends more time praising them than he does critiquing them. And in fact, he reserves his strongest criticisms for the socialists of his day. Uh, he, Marx is often taken as the founder of socialism or something, but that's just false. Uh, he is confused for what, in fact, he critiqued. Now, he didn't critique the socialists <coughs> because he thought they were bad, but because he wanted to see them succeed. And he thought that socialism embodied the revolutionary potential in capitalism that just could not be achieved. But it needed to be grounded as a science, as a historical method, rather than some utopian fantasy. Now, Marx, he came to the conclusion that capitalism must be overcome on the basis of capitalism itself. There's no hope for going backwards to some simpler time, to some idyllic past, as we talked about uh, before. Marx said that we need to learn from Rousseau and Hegel. The most radical possibilities of freedom take place in society. So naturally, the most advanced societies will have the most radical possibilities for freedom. No societies in history have been more advanced than when under capitalism. After all, the key to capitalism is more and more development. So much latent potential is hidden in modern technology just waiting to be put to use. But rather than technology being freeing, it actually keeps us in chains, the chains of unemployment. The more the worker produces, the more unfree he or she becomes. Technology, because it's privately owned, is used for profit. But Marx's conclusion is that technology can actually free us if we reorient the goal of society from profit to people. If society can take the means of production into their own hands collectively, with ownership not divided between capitalist and the worker, but shared among all in a classless society, then we can produce to meet our needs rather than the needs of capital. If the workplace, just like politics, was run democratically, then those who produce would also control what to do with what they produce. We would be free to work fewer hours. Who doesn't want to work fewer hours? <laughs> we could live the lives that we all want to before work gets in the way. If the workers can eliminate the competition between themselves, then the very foundations of capitalism will be cut out from under its feet. The unemployed would not be excluded from being productive, nor would the capitalists. With this massive influx into the workforce, partnered with the socialization of technology, we could meet all of the planet's current needs with mere hours of work. Matthew, what if you only had to work three hours a week, you got everything you needed and more, and you spent the rest of the time doing leisurely things? Sounds nice. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Additionally, if you remember from earlier, the existence of the state, it only becomes necessary with the invention of private property. 
A political structure was needed to keep the owning class in power and the working class subordinate. But with the social ownership of property, the state is unnecessary. When there are no class antagonisms, the state withers away. But the Marxist point is that by eliminating the burden of working for capital and spending years of our lives making commodities that no one needs, we would be free to change our needs. We can fundamentally improve what it means to be human, to discover new freedoms and possibilities hitherto never dreamed. Society as a whole can consciously guide its transformation rather than being unwitting victims to forces larger than itself. Um, and I want to read, in pre-modern societies, the ends of life are given, as we talked about the caste system and whatnot. It's, a t it's given that the same things will continue, meaning is inherent. The idea is to make the world not go forward, only around. But in modern societies, the ends of life are not given. They're thought to be created or discovered. The idea is not to repeat, but to change. It's, it's looked at as a failure if you do exactly what your parents did. If you don't do something new, then that's not very modern. That's, that's one way that society used to. Meaning is no longer inherent. That's what they meant. Um, death in modern societies is the great taboo, an absurdity, the worst thing one can imagine. At the close of life, people cannot look back and know that they have accomplished the task set for them at birth. The only certain knowledge death comes with is the knowledge that the values of one's own time, the values one has tried to live, are expungeable, that they're probably going to change after you die. But Marxism gave a meaning to modernity. The individual performs a role in that drama that Hegel discussed. Historical change is not arbitrary, but it's generated by class conflict. And it points towards an end, which is the establishment of the classless society. Marxism's deeper attraction was the discovery of meaning, and Marx and Engels were the philosophers of the second enlightenment. All right. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you call yourself. Here at Platypus, we do believe that Marx has a framework for thinking about these things. By reading Marx, it becomes clear that something lies beyond capitalism, but it still remains unclear what that something is. And the left has fundamentally abandoned most visions for new and greater forms of freedom. Today, what is called the left is a broken movement concerned with higher taxation, political correctness, and a firmer commitment to capitalism. But a left that is radically committed to social transformation? Nothing worthy of the name exists. So Platypus exists to ask why the left has failed historically and what it would take to reconstitute an emancipatory <coughs> left today. So to conclude this teach-in, I ask you to be realistic in your utopias, to always ask yourself what it would mean to be freer and what it would take to get there. And always ask yourself this, does Marxism even matter? <laughs> minutes that's not bad I appreciate you all for coming um, I've reserved some time for questions and answers but by no means do you have to stay this is totally on y'all Luke back there in the back so what policies are needed at the federal level today to reduce class division um, well it's a very complicated question and I do want to preface this by saying I'm just a senior, I by no means I'm an expert, and what I say is not indicative of all Marxism everywhere. Um, but it's twofold. One, um, you, have, you can't pretend that all of society's problems can be solved by just taking over the government. That was more or less a mistake of old left policies when you see things like um, I don't know, different, different things in history where they just thought, oh, if we take over the government, then everybody's minds will change and class antagonisms will be gone. But you also can't take the opposite approach and say that we can't, we don't even need to entertain politics at all. We don't have to have a political message if we just 
run out into the streets and have a social movement, if we break some windows and light cars on fire, then people's minds will change that way and politics will just ride off into the sunset. You can't really take that mindset either. Um, so you're asking like specific steps. One step that we exist in Platypus to do is not to form some kind of mass movement where we have everybody on our side. We just want enough people to start becoming conscious of the fact that, like Hegel pointed out, we actually control our own human nature. We control our destiny, if you will. Very cliche, but it's true. Um, the fact that capitalism is always considered natural, but really it's just one blip on the historical radar that hasn't always existed and it doesn't always have to exist. That if we realize that capitalism is not with, out of our control, that we in fact made it, then people will realize that they can make something else. Um, that's how I'd answer that question. Yes. Do you think issues of class transcend issues of race and gender and sexuality? Very good question. Um, Marxists are commonly insulted by calling them class reductionists. Has anybody heard that term before? As if we don't take the issue of racism seriously, as if we don't take the environment seriously, as if feminism and LGBT things are just off the table for us. That's actually completely false. Marxism, at least speaking for myself, we take each and every one of those things seriously. And in fact, in our reading group, we just hit two weeks of women, the longest revolution, and anti-black racism in the US during the 1960s. Ultimately though, we want to say that things like racism and patriarchy and environmental degradation and all these things, they don't simply boil down to class antagonisms, but they absolutely relate to them. And so many of those groups out there, like Black Lives Matter and New Age Feminism and things, they, they usually tend to ignore class antagonisms. They don't usually talk about what, what's going on in the economy. They think maybe if they just pass some laws for us, then that'll work. We don't have to touch the economy. Capitalism will provide for us. When Marxists don't in fact think that. They think all of those issues um, do relate in some way to the economy. Um, and the point is solidarity. The point is not to make all these groups insular. In fact, Black Lives Matter and the New Age Feminism often butt heads. They don't usually communicate when I think that's a tragedy because their issues are very interrelated. Matthew? Uh, I have a question. But, uh, <laughs> uh, this is still pertaining to the double class thing. Is that mm -hmm. I, I grew up in a rural area in Virginia and Florida, uh, lower middle class most of my life. And I'm saying that you were talking about uh, in capitalism, like business owners tend to do corrupt things, and I'm going to say that all of the places I've worked, business owners have drove in, you know, cars that were worth less than mine, and, you know, some, I've had business owners that we pay our wages on credit cards, so I was wondering what you would say about that when you would say that business owners tend to be free. Um, I don't mean to interpret your question this way, but I do want the record to reflect that. I never said they were greedy. Um, in fact, the decisions that owners make are very much a product of the society that they live in. It's not like they're choosing to screw people over. They are victims to this just as much as the workers are, in less obvious ways. Um, they are forced to make certain decisions that if push came to shove, they would have to lay off some people. They would have to cut the quality of the products just to keep the business afloat. When maybe they do have the interests of the workers in mind, but if times got tough, they wouldn't be able to reflect that. Um, there's, there's absolutely, um, there's absolutely a, a role for good people in, in capitalism. It's just those good people aren't, aren't bred necessarily. The system is working against them. Um, because like I said, they'll get outcompeted by the people that are willing to do other things. Um, Really, Marxists, their, their focus isn't always on the workplace, but one thing they want to see at the workplace is ownership collectively, where if you go to work, wait, where do you work, or where did you work? Uh, I worked at a local pizza place. You worked at a local yeah. pizza place? Um, so the, the people that own that pizza place, like I mentioned, currently it's top-down. They make decisions that affect you, but you're, you're not a part of that process. 
really we want you to be able to show up at work with a vote. It doesn't matter how much money you've put into the business, you still get a say in how it runs because you're part of the business. Um, it's, you could still, it, it, it's owned collectively, you could still pay certain people more, maybe your boss does more work than you so you might want to pay him a little bit more, or you got a coworker who's pretty damn good at making pizzas and he deserves a little bit more. Um, than others, you could still make those decisions, but the point is that you would at least be able to make those decisions, and you almost definitely wouldn't see the kind of gaps that we have nowadays where bosses make over 900 times what their workers make. Um, if you ever look at statistics, what people think people are making versus what people are actually making in this country, they're, they're staggering. I don't know if that answers your question. If it doesn't, press me for more. No, there was, there was clarification. Cool. Thank you. Yes. How would you motivate people to uh, perform difficult or uh, grody tasks? So I to propose or not not a, to propose an example, not necessarily a work example, but a recreational example. Take a cross country race for instance. Long distance running sucks. It takes a long time to do. It's incredibly painful. You're suffering for air the whole time. <coughs> There's no such thing as a good temperature to do. It's terrible. But everybody's out there chasing the top three positions and to better themselves. So how would you motivate workers in a society without having this top three positions for to advance yourself? Um, very good question, very good question. Um, I've got a two part, two ways I want to answer this. First, I don't necessarily have to have a perfect answer for you. Marxism doesn't project exactly how the future is going to be. What it says is, can we at least think how society might be different. Can we at least agree that society doesn't solve every problem and we want to make it better? The details of the future will be worked out in practice. Everything's worked out in practice. You try something, see that it doesn't work, and you improve upon it. Um, motivation, a lot of jobs like that, that are <coughs> drudgery, would be, fall out of the picture because it turns out they're not actually necessary. Uh, they don't meet our needs, they just fill a space in capitalism that that capitalism needs to keep um, going on. The jobs that wouldn't fall out, um, you maybe could get aut automation to do it. Maybe you can get a robot to do some work that formerly people had to do. Um, maybe you just have to say that there are certain jobs that you could never get a robot to do, but they have to be done. So you need some kind of different motivation. Um, maybe, maybe a whole ideological change happens in society where we just realize this work has to get done or else none of us get to enjoy society. So, so we do that work and we put up with it. We take turns. I only have to do an hour of the work formerly instead of 40 hours of work um, because so many people are helping me. Um, uh, yeah, yeah that's, that's how I'd answer that question. It press me for more. Um, so you said like volunteering. Yeah. I think people are naturally reluctant to do relatively crappy jobs, say like a garbage collection. I know I, if I had the ability to dodge that, I would definitely do it. So you have to create some form of government bureau to enforce it, therefore reducing freedom, which Marxism is set to for us. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe I don't really have a, a perfect answer for you. Um, what, what the burden might be on is just, a, you might have some kind of apparatus that doesn't necessarily qualify as a state, like we know it, but it is people d democratically and freely deciding like what kind of jobs need to be done. Um, if a master computer can't do that, people can do that. And you just have to have people telling you that you need to do this or else society is not going to function. Um, but you're not going to be doing it for profit, you're going to be doing it for yourself. Your own interests are going to be the reason why you do that work. Um, and as per uh, automation, so um, to say design something like uh, maybe extremely uh, uh, monotonous work in a factory that you could easily automate, you would, that would require a relatively advanced uh, system uh, most likely designed by somebody who's definitely not a common plebeian with a high degree of education. And most likely a team of those people who are going to be working at a higher level, who have a more analytical style of brain, 
and are more capable of designing such a system, how would you motivate them to not, say, take a job at a gas station, which would be easier and would pay the same as in a Marxist society? Do we have replies? or are these? Yeah. Reply? OK. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, Marxism and socialism are not the same thing. You're not proposing, Marxism doesn't propose a society in which everybody's paid X number of dollars an hour for work. It's, you could be paid more, say, to do that job versus, you know, the CEO of Papa John's is going to make the same as the cashier at the Quickie Mart, but he's not going to make 900 times what he's making. It's more equal wages, and so kind of finding that balance between the pay differential in those jobs versus the amount of effort that you have to put into them to try and equalize those things. And that is the way I'd want to approach that situation is who's, nobody said the future is going to be perfect. You're going to solve some problems in this society, but it's going to cre create new problems in the future. The, the hope is that those new problems are better than the ones that we have now. Um, and so in, in the specific situations like that still still deserve an answer. Um, come to our reading group, definitely help us, help us work on them. Um, did I respond to that? Sure. So if you had, like, say somebody at a gas station making minimum wage doing a relatively easy job that does not require virtually any training at all, and you had, say, a robotic, um, a robotics engineer, somebody who designs advanced systems in a factory, the markup to motivate somebody to end, uh, design a system such as that that takes such a level of expertise would have to be exponential to motivate that person to not be a gas station. Because if you could go to, you know, some very easy brain dead job, basically do nothing but work twice as long. I mean, an engineer, if you pay him, say, twice as much, which is still a rather high markup, that would not be enough of an incentive. So you'd still be resulting with a very, very, very high wage markup just to result in the automation, which would, in the end, cut jobs and increasing competition for Well, I can tell you that varies person to person, though. Yeah. I, I am, I'm an industrial engineering student. I'm about to graduate and go work. And I know how much to get paid differential, and if it was still less than that, I would still want to do it. Yes, but how many people are like that? It, it depends. I know a lot of people in my field that are like that, and it also depends on the system of education that you have coming up, because we're told as we're coming up that we're not working to preserve our livelihood, we're working to preserve the livelihood of our children's children. Do you believe all of your peers are that selfless? No, but I believe a lot of them are. And all you need is enough. Yeah. I mean, we live in a country with over 300 million people. That's a lot of selfless engineers. I doubt that there's that. Look at all of your teachers. None of them are motivated by money. <laughs> <laughs> your mother raised you. She wasn't motivated by money. People are doing all kinds of things that are not motivated by money. And very in, and being an engineer is not what you do if you were motivated by money. Definitely not what you do. You would go into business. You would go into Wall Street. Most people want to cr contribute to society, they want to follow their interests, they just some, don't want to study something or do something that won't work out, that won't allow them to live. I mean, really, it's all over the world. Almost nothing is explained by people's being incentivized by money. And the hardest working people in the world make money. There's that. Yeah, if, if, if hard work made you rich, then every mother in Africa would be a millionaire. Every mother in this country would be a millionaire. Well, maybe not every mother. Well, <laughs> 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 uh, maybe a question. Yeah, I have a question for you. Um, before my question, though, I'd just like to say thank you for everything you've said. I, I appreciated all your information. That was very well put together. Um, thank you so and much. And I say that you. as a constitutional conservative. So I am very diametrically opposed to a lot of things you said. But I really appreciate all of your efforts because I know how hard it is to put together a presentation like that. I know how hard it is to research, and I appreciate professionalism with that. So I just wanted to say that. Thank first you. Off, so thank you. And I appreciate talks like this so we can come and just talk, which I think is fantastic. Indeed. Um, and there, uh, let me just say, there are. We don't have to agree on everything. But there are other scenarios where you can come and engage Absolutely. in this kind of this kind of. So I, I very much reading appreciate groups, that. Reading groups. I'm going to pitch that hard. So, <laughs> <laughs> my question to you though is this: You said something in your speech. Um, that um, meant a lot to me, and you said specifically, through Marxism, how can we be more free in our society, right? And, and you didn't say that. How, through, through your Marxist teachings, how can we be more free in society? I would argue that in 2017, right now, we are as free as we have been in the history of humanity. 
And my example, um, can I give you a quick example and ask the question? All right, and that, that's my point. My example is this. Uh, my mom grew up in a trailer park in southern Houston, uh, very, very poor, bottom of the poverty level, um, dependent on welfare, very, very, very poor, had to do community share, had to do everything possible to make ends meet um, without any level of income. They, her dad traveled around, they moved all the time, trailer park, trailer park, trying to make ends meet, just, you know, bottom of the barrel poverty. She wanted to become a missionary and help people with her time. She wanted to give all of her effort into helping people make the world a better place, which I thought was a fantastic vision. Um, her mom told her, Gina, I would like you to do something else than being a missionary because I'd like you to make a profit. I'd like you to be able to take care of yourself, whereas missionaries you know, typically struggle with that. As idealistic as that is, I think it's fantastic, but I'd like you to do something else with your life. If you're interested in science, perhaps you should go into a scientific field. And she gave my mom the choice. She didn't force her. My mom decided to go into a scientific field. Um, she did very well in high school. Um, decided to pursue biology. She enjoyed biology and the development of life. Uh, and through that biology degree, um, she went to dental school. And again, like I said, she was she grew up in a trailer park, so it was very, very poor. She took out loans. She used government resources. She used everything available at her disposal to go to school. Do well, got scholarships, got to graduate school, went through dental school, had a very hard time, different story, but got through through her own efforts and everything she did used the resources at her availability, got through, got that degree, transitioned from that to have her own practice and make six figures. Throughout that entire process, um, she told me I did it all through my hard work. I did it through the resources given to me through our country. I gave it to the, uh, I was able to pursue it because of the freedom that I had. And as a poor white woman living in the trailer parks of Houston, she was able to proceed through that, through her initiative, initiative to make the most out of her life and to make a profit, to be able to take care of her family. And because of that, uh, she now goes on mission trips all the time using the available funds at her disposal. So that's a very long example. I'm sorry, to, I tried to summarize that as quick as possible. My question is, how are we not as free as possible when someone like her was able to go through that with the resources at her disposal without any interference, simply through her own willpower? And how would you say we're not free given that circumstance? This is a good question. Um, the phrasing of it is very important because, I, as you mentioned, constitutional conservative, is that the way you put it? Yeah. So, like, founded on those beliefs and from their conservative view, using that as a as a um, It's a very, very constitutional conservative way of framing the question as the freedom can only be the freedom of the individual. Mm -hmm. That success story is the American dream. That's, that's what everybody aspires to. But I think it's important to realize that that is not open to everyone um, just because of obstacles in, in the way capitalism works. Um, like I said, mathematically, literally, everyone can't do that. Um, some people have to work on, and some people benefit from that. Um, also, it's a, very, it's a very common way of putting it that because that, that well-off story worked here, that somehow everything's, as, it, everything's not a zero-sum game. If you work hard, then you're going to be rewarded and nobody else is going to be punished, but when in fact wealth is a zero-sum game, if somebody's benefiting, somebody is not benefiting on the other end. Um, capitalism is global, so because so many people might be more well off in America, somewhere else they are not. Um, capitalism pushes corporations and business owners to ever further boundaries. They push down walls just so they can make profits in other countries. Hence colonialism, hence imperialism, hence every war that's ever been fought because it was fought over resources. Um, so maybe Americans people are the beneficiaries of that kind of thing in some way, but other countries are not. Um, and that may be cool with some people. That may be able to be rational. If some people maybe are just better than others. That's one way I wouldn't want to approach it, though. I would. I want. I want to press you all and say, are you okay with that? That that kind of freedom is not open to everyone. Um, and one more thing I want to add is just because America has a dearth of commodities, we have more and more stuff than ever before, does that necessarily mean we are freer? Because if you look at statistics, wages ever since the mid-70s have been either stagnant or declining. Um, everybody, in fact, is earning less than they used to, um, well, every worker is, owners are making exorbitantly more. Um, and just because they have the ability to buy stuff, 
does not mean they're, and to advance maybe into a better job, doesn't necessarily mean they're free because they still are constrained by working 40, 50, 60 hours a week. They're still constrained by the kind of needs that they have now when they don't have the opportunity to even the very, very idealistic Marxist utopian vision of being able to change your needs, being able to pursue things that you wouldn't normally do because you're working. Um, I, I don't think I fully answered the question, but I, I, I can at least, feedback. At least address it. It's a different it. question to answer. I appreciate mm -hmm. feedback. Anybody else have replies? Yeah. I think what you have to understand is like that story you just told statistically for every porn time that happens, mm -hmm. there's 21,999 times that a poor person does not get that job, like does not finish school. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you came from a rich family, the chance of that happening, and you becoming a billionaire is about 1.2. So like your chances of becoming successful and becoming wealthy if you are from a treasure or if you're from a poor family is so much like just fantastically lower than someone that's rich that it's like you have to kind of either A, say that, well, 21,999 people that are poor are just more lazy and people that are rich work harder, or you have to accept the fact that there are institutions that keep that from happening here in this country, not explicitly, but and that kind of there is a sub, um, I'm not sure the word it, like I don't want to say like oppressive, but there are things in this country that prevent poor people from being successful and taking control of their own lives by their And that kind of ability to pull yourself up by your bootstraps was and still is heralded as one of the achievements of capitalism, but it also could very much be a limitation uh, of capitalism. Okay. Alexa. Okay. So I have a reply to you from earlier and also to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a sociology major, and a lot of this stuff is very sociological. Um, something that you said, like that's great. Like that story is amazing. Actually, I'm kind of like that. Like I, my parents can't pay for me to go to college. It's like all my college is like federally funded. I'm so lucky to be here. And I've worked, yeah, I've worked really hard academically to be here, and it's great that I can put in all that work, and I feel great about getting the returns on that kind of, like, I'm given the opportunity that people with rich parents are given because I've worked really hard. And, like, ever since I was in, like, second grade, I remember thinking, I have to make good grades because I want to go to college. Um, so as someone who is a product of that story, I think it's great, and I identify with that a lot, but then I also look at all these other people that it doesn't work out for. And something you were saying earlier about your bosses not being greedy, is a lot of these concepts, especially if you're the scope of sociology, aren't about individuals. It's not about being mean or having bad intentions or being evil. It's just about these things happen statistically. And if, like in sociology, you take a very objective approach. You're taking all the emotions out of it. You're just looking at things the way that they are on paper. And one of the greatest things about having the freedom to rework our system would be hearing each other's opinions. So like, it is so important, especially you too, um, having opposing opinions and bouncing them off of each other in a civil way is so important. Like, I, I was just reading a book from one of my classes about how the right and the left politically, and at the end of the day, they want the same things, but they can't even talk to each other about it because it's so hostile and so just like poisonous. Yeah, but it's like if you really, really break it down and look at it objectively, they want the same things. And it's just so crazy to me how people can't listen to things they don't agree with without becoming extremely emotional. But I just kind of like especially college has taught me to listen to things I don't agree with and think about why people think that. And try to really get on that level and like understand and learn. Like if I disagree with us, why do I disagree with it? And I've also learned to like, I'm very opinionated, but I've learned to take in information and be okay with not having an opinion on it. Like just being like confused, just being like, I just need to think about this and learn more before I can even say where I stand. So like just know too that like a lot of these issues are very objective. So like whenever people say that like the boss, like people are greedy or like, Capitalists are controlling all of society. It's not like an evil thing. It's just like this phenomenon is happening, and it's just it's just a certain type of jargon that people use. It's, it's hard to understand unless you're like. Really and let me just say, the people that approach that situation, the people on the left that want to denigrate all capitalists and hang them up by their necks and all that, those are the kind of leftists that we want to bring to the table and critique, because that doesn't necessarily. It's not obvious to me that that's the best way to go about handling capitalism. Um, is is not that way. It's we got to transcend it. 
using its using everything it has to offer. What a question for you. I don't see how an economy where you show up to work and all your other coworkers have the ability to vote down your ability to get a raise or dictate how much you get paid makes you freer. If anything, I, I would say that seems like you're almost putting yourself and your well-being in the hands of all those other people and you just have to trust that they will be fair to you. And I think that takes an absurd amount of optimism and trust if you're going to trust the collective to do, is, is do right concern, by people. Is your concern that you might want the opportunity to get more wealth, but you think you help people with that? Right. Okay. But then I would press you on going back to what is wealth. And wealth is just the... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wealth is the universality of needs, capacities, enjoyments, productive powers, everything. Um, and the only time... Well, in the economy, wealth is money, right? Because the economy runs on the, money. Take the form of money, yeah. I will say that money is pretty trivial, but it is important to me as a means of survival, to an extent. Because, and I, because the stuff that you need, food, shelter, funds like that is, is tied to having more money. What if it wasn't tied to having more money? Marxism is about asking the question, what would it take to even get beyond that? We don't need it. We, maybe we don't even need a system that works within the limitations of money. Um, don't, like, I, like are, I, so are we like just assuming in Marxism that everyone gets a subscription of Netflix just you know, like when you sign the dotted line? You wouldn't have to. You would get whatever they you needed and you would have the opportunity to Get more. I, I don't want to confuse Marxism, like somebody else mentioned. I don't want to confuse Marxism with socialism or communism. Marxism is a method. The method is a way of thinking about how to get to communism and socialism. It's not prophesizing what socialism and communism will be about. Those things, like I said, will be worked out in practice because I don't have an exact answer to you, like for you, what the future is going to look like. Um, I just. Marxism gets you to be asking those questions. It's not satisfying, I know, but it, I had to answer your question in a way. Gail? I think it's hard to even talk about things like that because we all look through it through the lens of capitalism, you know what I mean? Like, in my mind, I've never lived in a world without money. I can't even imagine what it would be like to work and not be motivated by a paycheck. So I think, like you were saying, it's not a prophecy of what's to come because we can't even imagine what that would be like. We would have to get there first to even think and figure out what kind of system would work in place of this system because we, we've never experienced anything else. So it's hard for us to even deliberate on things like that. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to sort of highlight the issue of, of freedom differently, which is that we live in a society in which most young people can more easily imagine the ecological catastrophe of the you know, destruction of the world and the descent of society into barbarism, where you know, the imagination of great writers comes up with works like The Road about the re-emergence of cannibalism, then they can world peace and the end of hunger. Those things sound completely utopian, and the road seems perfectly realistic. Right? The issue of, of freedom, of course, has an individual dimension, but it is ultimately about the capacity to steer the human future in relationship to nature, right? And this is where the issue is really historical. And I would say, you know, about the Constitution or the Enlightenment, those people would be astoundingly disappointed in humanity. People like Thomas Jefferson, they were slave owners, they lived in a much more barbarous society in some ways. 
But they would never have imagined that 200 years from now, most people would believe in astrology. Uh, or, I'm serious, I'm serious. <laughs> the mass irrationality of our society, uh, the, the white supremacism, the violence, the authoritarianism, the hatefulness, the sadism that is everywhere. Uh, you see it in pornography, it's everybody's fantasy, right? Uh, this is this is not progress uh, at all, where the imagination of the future is evacuated and human beings become more and more incapable of imagining the cooperative self-determination with other people, but rather just fear them. You know, I can't trust my coworkers. You know, the the issue that uh, of, you know of wealth. You know, you know, just, I mean, think of everything here. It didn't matter how much money you had a thousand years ago, you couldn't buy these glasses. It didn't matter how rich you were 50 years ago, you wouldn't be able to see this screen with a computer that runs it. Right? The, everything around us in terms of material wealth is not a function of something that we earn or simply can be embodied in money. It's a product of history in a very fundamental way. And it's a product of our interdependence. It's not a product of something that we've done that, and we can't trust other people. We, we're already in it. You know, we're already embedded in society in that way. Uh, so I, I guess I would say that you know, that's what Marx, to me, is about. You know, it's, it's, um, yeah, and, and he would, and he would certainly argue that. Individuals are not really free when what they can think to do with their freedom is so impoverished. You know, that what people want to do with their money is to build a house and a gated community to keep other people out, um, you know, in order to read books that are full of lies um, and to form you know, uh, you know, political projects that are about hating other people uh, or destroying other people. Like these are, this, is a, this is a profound unfreedom. And most rich people are super mediocre. They're super mediocre. They don't, you, there are no great artists, great musicians, great novelists that come out of the rich. I mean, some handful of rich people have been created, like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. Their children will not be that impressive. Their great-grandchildren will be completely decadent and mediocre rich people. <laughs> I'm serious. I hate you. Know, I mean, I've I, I, I been elite college with a lot of rich people. Uh, and, you know, they're just not the people you want to be friends with. Uh, you know, it's not really the case that way that we measure success, which is not just becoming a doctor, right? The capitalist class is not, the, the real American dream is being a capitalist, right? And most of them are, inherit their wealth, it's got nothing to do with merit, right? And they hire fund managers to reproduce it. They're not even involved in reproducing their wealth. And these people actually have immense amounts of social power. And they are very happy to have people who waste their time uh, thinking about white supremacy in the astrology column. They're very happy. In fact, they promote it. And that's all it is. Can I respond to that? I think that, I guess it's for everybody here that's a supporter of Marxism. Um, I think that you all are extremely well researched into the type of lifestyle and the type of things that we would like to see happen. No doubt. There are things that I didn't say anything about that. Well, I'm just saying you, 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 you there are things that we would love to see happen. And I agree that our society has some things that are atrocious. It's awful, it's disgusting, and a, a lot of our culture is just gross. I think we can all agree on that. There's just some nasty stuff going on in our culture. But at the same time, 
I think we have to be realistic into the human nature and what it really is. And I think everyone is motivated by their own selfish desires. I think that's really what it boils down to. As selfless as we want to be, as true as we want to be to our causes and our faith and everything, the true nature that we all have inside of us is to pursue what we desire, what we want the most. I would say that's kind of a fair argument, right? And I would say that was true for the first 190,000 years of our species I when we were all hunters and gatherers. Everyone and there was no private property. pursues what they believe they want and what they are concerned with. And there is a part, I have to bring this up because I'm sorry, because I'm, you know, I told you my, my, my background. The preamble says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect unit, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, welfare, secure the blessing of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. And I would argue, because you brought up Thomas Jefferson, big proponent of that, that we have, we have all of it. We have every single one of those. He and our founding fathers made sure that was established. It's been, in the, it's been a part of us ever since our foundation. Yes, we've had trouble. We've had a civil war fought over. We've had many amendments added to it. But at this point in our history... But what do we have that we didn't have before the Constitution? What do we have now? That we yeah, what was listed there that was secured by the Constitution? What was secured by the Constitution? You mean like when it was first founded? I mean, did we have all those things under George III? Under George, like, uh, no, I would argue not. But I would, I can get back to that. For this original thing, I want to say, our country is the greatest country on the, the planet, and I, regardless if you believe that or not, we have had these things for a very long time. And because of that, that allows us to live and act and choose to do whatever we want in a way no other country has ever provided. So I would say that Marxism has some great ideas. I think what you guys want to do for the worker and for humanity and for the planet, it sounds fantastic. Like, to move us forward and to move us forward idealistically, to make life better, to make things more fair for people, I think that's fantastic. I just don't think it is realistic. And I think, and I, I wanted to ask you, challenge you, is there a situation, historically, where this method of Marxism has been used effectively and life dramatically got better? I want to. I would. Sorry. The way I want to answer this question is: If you've been politicized in the way that you have, and you've come to the conclusions that you, you think you know what human nature is, and you think that this is the best country on earth, then maybe Marxism is not for you. But do everyone else in the room? that might not be sold on this thing, that might still have questions about if this is really the freest society that we could have, or if it's not the freest society, but getting to that society is just unrealistic and we shouldn't think about it. That's what Marxism is for. You have to say one thing yeah, sure. in response to that, sure. which is that the world that the Constitution imagined is gone. It's completely gone. There's no such thing as private property in this country. I mean that. I don't know about that. Corporations that are private property in any way that Thomas Jefferson or James Madison ever could dream of. And if a corporation fails, it's bailed out by the state. Right? Just look at what happens with Chrysler or Lehman Brothers or anything else. That's not private property. I don't, I don't know. Corporations have rights that, like, the course, we, that's why that's one of my classes. They, they actually have the rights of a human being. Yeah, they do. They are legal persons. They're treated through an immense legal fiction as if there was a factory owner who owned it, who was the guy. I just want to go as far as to say they aren't private. They're a very strange hybrid of private and public. What because I'm saying is, is, is that capitalism started. has destroyed society and recreated it over and over and over again. Right? It's And, and if you don't think that you live in a world of public ownership, right? It's just socialism for the rich, right? It's the taxpayers who will bail out Wall Street and will bail out the bankers. They never go bankrupt. The rich never suffered the consequences of misallocating capital. Adam Smith's world is gone, completely <coughs> vanished, right? We live in a world that is, you know, I mean, yeah, you can go out and you can, you know, open a store. You can be petty bourgeois. But you don't have the power 
that real property has. That's, you know, the small business owner isn't driving the economy. It's a, that's a democratic fiction that, that makes people happy, that wins votes to say the little guy is what really drives the economy. But the reality is that, you know, all of the good jobs that have ever been produced were produced in this country by, by massive amalgamations of capital. Working for a small business owner sucks. It sucks. You never, you'll never do well that way. You'll never go and make $100,000 as an engineer working for a small business. You'll go, for, you'll go work for Exxon or someplace else. And those places are not private. Exxon has an army. It's called the U.S. government. <laughs> which goes out and makes war for it in the Middle East and all over the place, yeah. right? That's what I mean. They, they treat that as if it were just private property, some <coughs> entrepreneur is, you know, I, I think of, uh, you know, Marx loved the Constitution. He loved the American Revolution. He thought that that was an immense uh, development. He thought that that form of freedom had come into crisis, what he would call bourgeois society. And the reason why, the elemental reason why, is that nobody in the 18th century, nobody, had ever heard of or conceived of the elementary problem of capital, which is unemployment. Right? And we live in a world of billions of disposable people people that will never have good jobs. Sub-Saharan Africa will never be industrialized. It doesn't matter how hard they work, no matter how hard they try, no matter how hard they strive, no matter how much they do, everything your mother did, they will never live in that world. And that's true in immense parts of the world. In fact, the places where it's possible to get a decent job seem to be shrinking, which is why we're, all of a sudden everybody hates immigrants and everybody's America first and don't trust them you know, because the economy is actually shrinking around the world in terms of who can work in a factory, who can make $40 an hour. Right? So I, I guess I would just say, you know, to really ask yourself, is that the world we live in? They never, ever, ever met. Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, never met a bum in their lives. They never met anybody who was homeless because it did not exist. Systemic unemployment did not exist. Opioid crises did not exist. You know, rampant mental illness did not exist in that world. It really did. It was really a very different world that produced that document. Can I ask you a question about that? Um, private property specifically? Uh, I'm a major proponent of private property, private things. If, if you make $50,000, 60000 dollars $80,000 a year, I believe everything you buy is yours and completely. My mom, who is a business owner, um, you has seven employees, and she pays her assistant, a 22-year-old girl, graduate from UT Memphis uh, Dental School, a uh, Salary of thirty-two dollars an hour, so she makes you know, give or take, you know, roughly sixty a year, depending on how taxes go. Let's just say on average, right? Because she's thirty-two an hour. Based off of my mom's hard work, she's produced a business and she pays someone who makes that money. That girl lives in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Has purchased her own house. Has been very smart and invested in college with her part-time job. Has now paid off that house and legally owns that property. Um, she's also married and has one kid who she buys things and provides for to the best of her ability with her husband who also works as an engineer. They, in my opinion, have prospered because of their hard work in our free market economy and live very well with the freedoms afforded to them. And everything they purchase, they own and they've earned it. So my question is, through that hard work and the system we have been afforded in our generation, how is that not private property? As it's all been paid off in your legally, brother's office. Legally Every owned. single thing in your mother's office was produced by a company. Yeah, it's like this and this and the software on her computers and the, the equipment that she uses in her office. It's, she is simply the end user of 
and, and, and of, of a world that, of, of, a, of a body of production that was made elsewhere, not through her efforts. But is right. that how it All really the, works? You have to purchase things in the economy. Uh, yeah, but none of it was produced by small businesses. That's my point. None of them, not any of it, was produced yes. by an individual entrepreneur with 12 employees. That's why I say there, there is a petty bourgeois strata of small employers, and then there's big corporate capital. And big corporate capital is what produced everything in this room. The glass, everything, your shirts, you know, none of it was done by, you know, mom and pop. It really wasn't. Uh, just like a, a shopkeeper can go, and I could go and own it, you know, I could buy a 7-Eleven, and I could hire some people. And I could maybe even pay them well if my shop did really well. Uh, but everything in the shop, in fact, the way to put it together, all of it, would have been produced. You know, I'm just the person who happens to do that. I can't change the economy from that status. Right? And that's why I say it's like being a consumer. Sorry, I, I was going to say that. Ask Ethan a question. No, <laughs> What time is it? It's 6.37. Yeah, it's 6.37. 6.37? Okay, well, I actually have a meeting. I need to get to at 7. <laughs> <laughs> I do. You can. Um, but I can think of, like, maybe one more question. Yeah, yeah he wants one more response. Isn't that the end goal of the economy, though? To have increased jobs and production specialization to increase the quality of Marx's point is that our economy produces <coughs> that our economy could produce massive amounts of free time. The one thing we cannot do is put 6.5 billion people to work. In fact, it doesn't do that. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, our economy has produced unemployment. It discards people. It shocks. It has to do that. It's not because of immigrants that we don't have nearly as many people working in factories in America as we did in 1965. 